All right, hi everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for uh, re-entering the space with us. I hope that lunch was good. I hope you met a bunch of cool people. I hope your trainings were effective. You feel confident for your lobby visits. And if you're not quite there yet, there will be more opportunities to plan and, and have these conversations. So right now, we're going to do our workshop titled Reaching Across. And I'll take a seat now that we have everyone's attention. Um, so you all have the description of this workshop in your folders, but I'll just read it out so we get a sense of what we're going to be talking about today, and then I'll introduce our wonderful speakers, and we'll get started. So how can we approach conservative offices about a pathway to citizenship? This question has come up, I think, multiple times already this weekend. In a divided Congress, it's important to have bipartisan conversations on every issue. We will discuss why this has become such a politicized issue, and we will hear from experts on how to bridge the gap with our advocacy. So we are joined by Laura Collins. Laura serves as the director of the Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative at the George W. Bush Institute. Ms. Collins previously served as the director of immigration policy at the American Action Forum. She has experience in politics, working as a senior research analyst at the Republican National Committee for the 2012 election cycle, and in the Texas House of Representatives for the 82nd legislature. I don't know if there's any Texas people here today. There we go. Oh, lots we, of them. I knew there we had we some go. at the event. I wasn't sure if we would have some at this workshop. That's great. There you go. A former practicing attorney, Ms. Collins earned a JD from the University of Texas School of Law and a BBA from the University of Oklahoma. Welcome, Laura. And we have Teresa Cardinal Brown, who is BPC's, um, which is the, let me see, Bipartisan Policy Center, um, is the Bipartisan Policy Center's Managing Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy. She came to BPC from her own consulting firm, Cardinal North Strategies, LLC. Brown's immigration policy background is vast and extensive having previously served as the Director of Immigration and Border Policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Associate Director of Business Immigration Advocacy at the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and worked in the, immig and worked in the immigration practices of large Washington, D.C.-based law firms. Brown is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Delaware. Yay, with blue a hands. Anybody? Yeah. Hey! Hey! We have one. <laughs> Um, graduate of the University of Delaware with a degree in international relations and economics. Okay, so we're in good hands today. And we're going to start with, I would say, something more general and, you know, we can get more specific as we go. So to both of you, I'll let you decide who wants <laughs> to go first. Where do you see U.S. immigration policies that protect undocumented communities, which is what we're here to talk about, in five to 10 years? Where do you think we'll be in five to 10 years? And how do you envision that we get there? Oh, gosh, that's such a big question, right? Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> We're all thinking about that all the time. We are all thinking about that. I think, um, and, I, and I recognize this is difficult in a midterm year. We know we have some legislation that's passed the House. We know that there is always a chance the Senate would take it up. Um, but right now, I think we're still very much in a place where we're looking at executive actions as sort of the way that people are being protected. Um, and that's bad. And the reason that's bad is because it's not adequate, right? We know that um, administrations can take things away. We know courts can take things away. And we know that it's a limited effect if you have an executive action. So legislation could give people a permanent pathway. Um, executive action pretty much can just limit to protections and some work authorizations. So it's not yeah. sunny, but it's not all bad news. Yeah, I mean, if we're looking at five to 10 years, though, um, look, I'm, I'm a glass is half full kind of person. I've been doing immigration law for 25 years, which makes me an optimist or a masochist. So I choose the former. Um, and I say there's always a chance. Now, that chance could be 5%. That chance could be 80%. Right now, it's closer to 5%, honestly, in terms of legislation. Uh, and, and it's not just on immigration. Uh, Congress has a hard time passing, frankly, just about anything. And it has a hard time passing just about anything on a bipartisan basis. It's either like everybody agrees or it's right on the party line. 
<laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty much all we get. And that makes it difficult for issues that are going to require bipartisanship, a, a mix of both parties to really get it done. Um, immigration is one of those issues which makes it difficult. I don't think it's, I don't think it's impossible. Um, a lot may depend on what happens after the midterms. So there's a wide expectation that Republicans will take back the House. Um, they may take back the Senate. Um, we still have a Democratic president in the White House. What does that mean? Well, that means if the president wants to get anything done in his last, in the next two years, he's going to have to work across the aisle. That increases the chances for bipartisanship on a lot of things. Um, the flip side of that is that Republicans have to want to work with him and give him some sort of victory on, any, on something before the presidential election in 2024. Um, so there's opportunity and there's also challenges. And I think the issue for immigration is be ready for the opportunities, but recognize the challenges and keep pushing. Yeah, I like that. Recognize the opportunities and what was the second point? Be aware of the challenges. Be aware of the challenges. I think that's, that's really important. So, you know, immigration reform is a very comprehensive issue. There's so many points within that larger umbrella, right? And this weekend, we are talking about one specific thing, like I said, the pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. And so in your work, what would you say are meaningful starting points that you have found with moderate to conservative offices for discussing solutions for individuals with undocumented status? I think uh, some of us need a starting point. Like, what is that starting point for those moderate to conservative offices? You know, I think for me, it really depends on um, and, and a lot of this is just sort of having like open conversations and figuring out where you have aligned values. Some of those members really care about things like civic institutions and communities and cohesiveness and getting them to a point where they can understand that, you know, having people earn a way to stay here is a good thing for a community. Um, some people get there um, on that path. Some of them really, it is still a security issue, right? But if you can show them that when you bring people into a system and we know who they are, that that is a more secure system, I think that's an, that's an inroad that not a lot of people take mm -hmm. because it feels like when we talk about security, it feels like we're trying to keep people out or we're trying to deport people. And, and security is just another way of, of looking at the same issue and saying, how do we allay people's fears? And, and I think you can also, there are some for, for whom the moral argument is really strong. Um, we do hear from a lot of offices who have strong evangelical Christian backgrounds, for example. They really do care about the morality of having people here who um, aren't able to fully realize their potential and what it means for us to be a welcoming nation. The politics of it for them are a lot harder sometimes, just given the makeups of their districts. But in terms of the policy, some of them really do understand that on a moral level. And so those are the sorts of things that you know you have to sort of have those conversations to know where those values overlap. Yeah, I think one of the things you'll find when you go in and talk to a congressional office is, are they going to start on the politics or are they going to start on the policy? Yeah. Um, and that's really where the dividing line is. There are many people, um, including many Republicans, who very well do support a path to citizenship for the undocumented. They don't have a problem with that. But they get caught up in various politics. Um, the politics of saying, well, if we do this now, why would we not have to do it again in 10 years? So I couldn't see doing that unless we secure the border, or unless we pick your, pick your thing. Um, that's a political decision. It's, it's, it's related policy, but it's also a political decision. Um, so far, part of it is just figuring out like where, exactly as Laura said, where are they at? What is their coming from? If you're talking to a staff member, where is their boss coming from? Where is the member coming from? Where are the constituencies he's hearing from most? And what does he think about that? The other thing to recognize is that for most people, their understanding of the immigration system, of why people are undocumented or how they become undocumented and the challenges of getting documented is not very sophisticated. Right. They don't know a lot. So they may have you know, f f false ideas like, well, they could all get their papers if they just got in line, right? We all know, hopefully we all know that's not realistic given our immigration system where it is now. So we have to create that path. Um, I think all of the, the angles that Laura talked about, um, you know, talking, f figuring out where they're coming from on the issue and trying to address those, those concerns, um, but also talking from your own perspective. Yeah. Why do you care about the issue? What, bring it, what brought it home to you? Why are you here? Is it personal? Is it family? Is it someone you know, a friend? Is it your community? Why are you there? 
know that and talk and speak from your heart as well. And then meet them where they are, right? It's not an argument, it's an understanding. We have to start by understanding where each other is and then find those bridges that can help us find a place of agreement. It may not be total agreement, it may be a step here and a step there, but every conversation moves things in the direction. Um, the, only, the only other angle that I might think about is the economic one. Yeah. Um, you know, we are seeing as we're coming out of the COVID recession a lot of needs in the economy for people who can work. Um, we know that most undocumented people are working already, but it would be better for everybody if they could work legally. It would be better for the employers. It would be better for their families. It would be better for the communities. It would be better for the tax base, if that matters for the member, um, that everybody's paying into the system. Um, all of those things, I think, are also ways that you can kind of approach the, the, approach the issue. Yeah, I, I appreciate um, somewhere in the middle there you said that there might even be a misunderstanding or, or a miss conception around like the circumstances of applying for citizenship or you know being undocumented and that's something we discussed yesterday in terms of storytelling the fact that legislative offices do their best to know what's going on but they also can't know everything and having our stories um, cut through some of that and give, uh, like, you know, I, I would say fill in those gaps that you kind of talked yeah. about is really, it sounds like is really important. Education is really important. A couple things to bear in mind, particularly if you're on the House side, a staffer who deals with immigration probably deals with seven other issues mm -hmm. on average that have nothing to do with immigration, right. right? They may be young. This may be their first time ever working in Congress or they may have been only there a couple of years. If their member is not on a committee that oversees immigration, they will have even less exposure to the issue. They will probably only know the talking points that their bosses have been given by the party, right? So you have an opportunity to provide more context, more education for them and for their boss. So that's another important thing to understand. And providing solutions for those folks in particular, right? I mean, we hear from a lot of offices who you know, their member doesn't live in a border state or near the border, but they're very, very concerned about drugs, right? Well, drugs are coming through ports of entry, not across, not between ports of entry. And so one of the things we do is we give them a toolkit and say, look, here are the various ways that you can actually reduce drug trafficking into the United States. And it's not about what you think. It's probably not about a wall and it's not about illegal immigration, right? It's about how do we strengthen those ports of entry so we know what's coming in there. And that gives them something constructive. Their boss can then go work on that. Their boss can turn around and go to their constituents and say, look at the good things that I did to reduce the number of drugs that are coming in. That makes that not an immigration issue because it never was an immigration issue, but it gets rolled into the larger conversation. And so helping them piece those out, right? And yeah. find where they can actually have some impact on a conversation that sometimes is really gridlocked. I mean, that to me is a perfect example of what you just said, Teresa, about meeting people where they're at, right? So hearing, okay, you have a problem with this because of, you said, drug trafficking. Yeah. Okay, well, let's figure out what solutions there are for that issue, and then we can show that they're not actually related issues, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's a, that's a good example of, of meeting people where they're at. So you also mentioned, going back now, I think a couple of minutes, you mentioned evangelical offices, actually. And that is my next question for you, Laura. What advice would you offer faith communities that are interested in advocating for these protections, both on the Hill and in their local communities? I mean, th there's various, I think, uh, faith identities represented here. We are a faith-based Quaker organization. Um, so it, it will be important to know what role that plays. And, and how faith communities can step into whatever role they should. Yeah, you know, faith communities do such a good job of doing the sort of hands-on, on-the-ground work, right? Um, we've seen that, whether it's welcoming Afghan evacuees, whether it's in refugee resettlement generally, whether it's, you know, doing the work for asylum seekers at the border. We know faith communities are everywhere doing the hard work. They have the stories. They know the people that they are serving. They know what the actual gaps and problems are instead of the sort of big picture political conversation. And so they can really bring some ground truth to these conversations. And you know, it helps that these are issues that they care deeply about because that authenticity matters so much in this. It's not, they're not making, they're not going to benefit monetarily from any of this. They're not going to, it's not going to change their workforce. 
They're doing it because they actually care about people and good policy. And I think that lends that extra sort of little bit that, you know, there's less of that motive, that people aren't suspicious necessarily when you go in and, and talk about these things. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard this. I've heard this a lot. Um, sometimes you'll you'll hear, well, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, for example, only yeah. wants immigration reform for cheap labor. Yeah. Faith groups don't have to worry about that, right? That's Faith groups are, issue. that's not your issue, right? So you yeah. can actually go talk about people and why, and make this about human beings. So often the immigration debate is not focused on the fact that these are real people. And, and that's just, you know, and, and I think also, I think a lot of what we do, um, and I, I was raised Catholic and I still attended to Catholic church and sometimes we can look at these things and see differences, but we all know we have very similar values at the core. And that is what I'm trying to look for also when I talk to these offices. Where do our values align? And I think that's an important role for faith communities too. I, I agree. I think one is telling the stories. As I said, what's your personal connection? Why are you there talking about it? What brought you to the issue? Um, that's, that's the most important thing to share. Share your own personal perspective. Um, and from a faith perspective, if that's what's bringing you to the issue, why do you connect your faith to the issue? What connects it? Is it family values? Is it, you know, a teaching of, you know, I'm a, I'm a Presbyterian, so I believe that Jesus said pretty clearly in Matthew 25 what we do for the least of these, yeah. right? So I have, a, I have a command from Jesus to do this, right? If that's what you believe, then that's what you should say. Mm -hmm. The member or their staff may come from a different perspective, but they can't argue with that, your own faith. Um, but you may find a place of commonality. Um, and I do think that it is also true that people, it's easy for people to talk about immigrants as a cohesive whole, as a term that's the other. Um, but you talk about the person you know, or the family you know, or the people in your community, and how they are connected to your community, and how they are involved in your community. And suddenly, the immigrants, that generic term, becomes a human being with a name and a face and a story. I like that you said um, people aren't going to argue faith or your values with you. Like if you're saying, this is my value, that's something that can't, yeah. it's, 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 it's not like a sentence on, on, a, on a report or something, right? It's, it's not yeah, your opinion. It's not, yeah, it's not exactly. really debatable. Um, I mean, they can tell you from their perspective, well, my value is different, okay? Right. What's your value? Well, my boss values law and order, and these people broke the law. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Why yeah. do you think that's the most yeah. important thing to do here, and what can we do to d address where we are yeah. right now? Um, you know, I, as a bipartisan organization, I work with a lot of people. One of the strongest arguments for a pathway to citizenship I ever heard was from Haley Barber, who's a former Republican National Committee chairman, former governor of Mississippi. He's, you have to imagine a, a larger man with a big Southern drawl that I can't do. But he said basically, look, every day people go into court and have to tell you for a judge that they got into a bar fight down the, down the street and they hit somebody upside with a beer bottle. And they say, I'm sorry, judge, I did that. And the judge says, okay, well, you're sentenced to, you know, community service and some probation. And if you serve your time at the end of that, you're back on the good side of the law. And yet we do not allow that mm -hmm. grace to undocumented immigrants. There is no way in law for them to actively on their own get back on the right side of the law. So if you are somebody who believes in law and order, why aren't you allowing a pathway back? Yeah. Um, it's like saying, you know, deportation is the only punishment for any violation of immigration law, whether you ever stayed one day or you entered four times. There's one penalty. We don't do that in any other criminal law or anything else. So why are we doing it here? So if that's the perspective they have, maybe you can get them to think about it a little bit more. And sometimes just thinking about it is enough of a victory, right? Yeah, yeah. Like um, getting people to sort of question their own assumptions. And I find that the longer you have conversations, the more often you're talking and meeting with these offices, the more often you're going to have that genuine conversation, right? You get them off their talking points. And I've had people say things that I really have huge disagreement with. I mean, um, put, I had a conversation with an office one time where they were really, really, um, upset about poll factors, right? The things that they thought were drawing people to come um, to the United States and, and become undocumented. And I had just gotten out of a meeting uh, where we had been listening to some people talk about the statistics 
during the pandemic of the incidence of teen pregnancy for Central American girls ages 10 to 14. We all know here that if you're a Central American girl 10 to 14, you're not getting pregnant because you're just bored, right? Like that's coercion, that's informal unions, there's lots of societal problems there. That's not a pull factor, right? Those people are leaving and trying to come here because the situation on the ground has pushed them out. And I, you know, if, and so it would have been really nice to have probably a more productive conversation about that. But I did just tell them, I was like, look, fair. You think that we have too many job opportunities. We're not bad and, you know, we're not good enough at cracking down on employers. But I think you really need to know this statistic because this is what the reality on the ground looks like. Those girls aren't thinking about that job opportunity where no one's gonna check their papers. They're just trying to have a good life and survive, right? And that perspective, I think, sometimes they get very much in their bubble about yeah. thinking about the things that they are very concerned about, that they neglect the other pieces. Yeah, I think, you know, if you're gonna talk about status for the undocumented, you're never really gonna get into a conversation about the border. Right. And I think I've had enough of these conversations, particularly in Republican <laughs> offices, that when they, when they rebut you know, path to citizenship with border. Underneath that is not necessarily an, I oppose a path to citizenship. An awful lot of times it's thinking about this on a broader policy goal. It goes back to what I said. The majority of people, Republicans and Democrats in this country, and I think the majority of people on Capitol Hill, do not have a problem with offering a path to citizenship. They don't have a problem with that. They have a policy issue with doing that alone. Because if you want to think about it, a path to citizenship for people who are currently here undocumented is not really reforming the system. It's relief for people who are already here. It's taking care of a problem that was caused by a broken system, but it's not fixing the system. The day after you legalize everybody here, you're going to have more people coming at the border, and you're going to have more people becoming undocumented. What happens to them? And I think that's the underlying question a lot of people that they, again, not having a sophisticated understanding of immigration, their response to that was, we need to secure the border so that doesn't happen again. Except the border isn't where a lot of this is happening. People come in on visas and then overstay. That's not a border issue, right? That's an issue of the immigration system being broken. So finding a way to talk about the situation of the undocumented, but recognizing that it is not completely separate from the needs we have to fix our immigration system to make it work better in the future. The needs we have to have a better system at the border is what I say, managing migration, not just border security. Um, I think those are related issues, and you may not be prepared to talk about any of them, but understand in your mind and acknowledge that that, that is related. Right. Um, it's not just a, I'm saying border security because I don't want to do amnesty. There are some people who believe that, honestly. But I think for an awful lot of offices, particularly conservative offices, it's that that's not sufficient. There has to be more done. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's some of the political issue that's underlying this too. Yeah, I, I hope people are taking some notes because <laughs> um, in my experience, that a question of the border is actually one of, if I had to rank them, probably like the top pushback that I have heard from our organizers, um, just you know, in my experience, yeah. kind of conflating the two issues and hearing you talk about how they are or aren't connected is really important. And yeah. I, I hope people can uh, internalize some of that, especially if you're going into a conservative office and you might hear that, that pushback. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you now, Teresa, I know at the beginning you said there's not much of a chance for bipartisan <laughs> uh, solutions. But I'm going to ask you anyway, at yeah. least you know, at the, at the moment, with, with the, the yeah. political climate we're dealing with, um, what headway, if any, mm -hmm. <laughs> have you seen bipartisan efforts make in modern immigration policy? So you know, maybe not this year, but in the last decade or 15 years, and what has led to that progress? I will be honest that the, the pieces of legislation that get the most frequent and largest amount of bipartisan support tend to be bills that deal with fixing the immigration system for workforce needs that include legalization, things like the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. Um, 
or bills that are dealing with a couple of emer uh, emergent issues. Like there's something called a Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act that is about freeing up more visas for people who are working on the front lines of healthcare during COVID, right? That's, that's got a huge bipartisan support. And I think one of the reasons for this is, is it's combining what I said before, fixing the legal immigration system, addressing some of those workforce and economic issues, which tend to be of a little bit more salience on the conservative side, um, with recognizing that legalizing people already here is part of that. Um, and I think those bills tend to get the most momentum and most support and the most bipartisanship. Um, Otherwise, you're looking at things that are essentially big compromise deals. Um, and those compromise deals, like you know, uh, during 2018 when we were trying to uh, have Congress pass something to address the status of DACA recipients, um, there were a few different deals on the table that were combinations of legalization for DACA recipients and or DREAMers with different aspects of border security because that was the issues that would grip, get the votes, right? That, that was addressing the two priorities of either side um, and help grow the vote. And um, those are the ones that came closest, but we still haven't gotten over the hump yet. And I think part of the reason is that right now, people find it very hard to compromise on a position. Um, there is a lot of um, all or nothingness, uh, I think, about the positions that a lot of people have. Um, a lot of people on uh, the conservative side will say, I'm not going to allow border security. I'm not going to allow legalization unless I get border security because it'll never happen if we don't do it now. Um, so their number one priority is this border security or making sure we don't have to do this again. And for folks on the Democratic side or on the left, the number one priority is legalization for as many people as possible. The flip side of that is legalization for as many people as possible without having to give away anything or with giving away as little as possible on the enforcement side. Well, that's not realistic based on where we are right now politically. There's going to have to be some give and take. There's going to have to be compromise on both sides to make it happen. And because the margins of majority in both houses are so small, those compromises have to make sure you gain votes and not lose more. That's the challenge. If you're trying to work only on one side of the aisle right now in the House, the Democrats have a three-seat majority. That means if they're going to try to do something only with Democratic votes, they have to get everybody on the most progressive side of their, of their aisle and the most moderate, conservative, middle-of-the-road you know, swing seat person who's really in danger of losing to a Republican next election. They have to get them both on the same page. That's really hard. It's really hard. It's actually easier to get people in the middle together than it is to get both ends of the party spectrum together. Um, and that's true in the Senate, too. So that's the political reality that makes it very hard. Yeah, so my last question actually was about border security. <laughs> I was looking down. I thought, oh, border security sounds familiar. OK, yeah. so we already touched on it a little bit. But I'd love to hear Laura. I mean, yeah. we heard from Teresa if you wanted to add anything about what to do if we hear that pushback and maybe how to approach a conversation where we can kind of detach the two from each other. Yeah, I mean, you know, the way we approach border policy at the Bush Institute is basically giving a lot of people solutions. You know, Teresa talks about management. We talk about that a little bit too. And we, we talk about it as border policy, not border security, because it's not just about who are we stopping from coming in. It's about how do we facilitate that legitimate trade and travel that we know happens at the border. The border is about so much more than um, migration. It's about so much more than um, perceived insecurity. And so, you know, and I will admit, we didn't really, we used to work on this as only an economics issue. We didn't talk about humanitarian migration. We didn't talk that much about the undocumented. We didn't talk about border policy. And we changed that in the last year. And so it is, it is the sort of thing that I'm probably less comfortable talking about border policy than I am talking about why we need more, um, more green cards for highly skilled workers, right? Um, but it is, it is important to so many of those political conversations. And so fam getting familiar with where you, where you feel border policy needs to be and what it means, right? And, and so you know when those issues come up what people are really talking about. That goes back to the drugs at the ports of entry. If you know that the drugs come into ports of entry and not between ports of entry, you have a good way to talk about that mm -hmm. and a good constructive thing to say. 
If you know that people who enter illegally but request asylum are still getting a legal entry, then you can have something to say about that when someone says, oh, it's just all of these illegal immigrants coming in and they're not going to, you know, they're, that's, and that's bad. No, they're coming to ask for asylum. That's a legal process. Wouldn't it be nicer if they could come and request for asylum at a port of entry? And really try to shape what that narrative looks like because there are things we can do that are practical, that can be done, that take that emotion out of that debate and really talk about the things that are happening because so often it is a political talking point to talk about border security. But we know it's important. We know that there are things you can do to change what that looks like um, at the border and to make it actually work and functional, not just for our immigration system, but for the people who actually live and travel across that border every single day. And we lose sight of them and their needs if we talk too much about a single piece of border security, whether that's just physical infrastructure, whether that's just border patrol agents. Right, we've got to think about this in big picture and what does it mean to really have a holistic view of something like border policy. And I'll just add one part of my bio that you didn't read is that I did work for CBP and DHS for six and a half years. I worked for two different secretaries under the Bush and Obama administration, so uh, both a Republican and Democratic president. And both secretaries said in public forum and to, and to Congress, if you want me to secure the border, get me more legal visas. Yep. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have systematically closed off legal avenues for people to apply for asylum, so the only way left to them is to come undocumented illegally between the ports yep. of entry. Mm -hmm. When you close off avenues, you're forcing people into more dangerous territory to doing things that are you know, around the law because it's not the pull factors, it's the push factors. It is, yeah. They really believe if they stayed where they were, they would die. They will die. And if that's what they believe, it doesn't really matter what the system at the border looks like. They're going to try. Well, the economics of it makes sense for them, right? The I economics mean, it, make sense, but even you, more so, it's a life or death matter for is. so many of them. And, and if you know that your cousin or your brother or whoever it is that you knew from before is here making enough money to support themselves and their family back home and lift entire generations out of poverty, yeah. That prospect, like no one in the United States is going to say, well, we're just going to lower our wages so that those, that's not an attractive thing, right? Like that's not, it's not practical, but we know that's the reality. Um, there's a really, I don't know if you've read this book, it's called A Good Provider is One Who Leaves and it talks yeah. about Philippine migration and, and what yeah. it looks like for generations of people to go work abroad and, and how it helps their families. And it's just such a good illustration of what this is. And, we can't, we're not going to do the things we need to do to change those incentives because it would destroy our economy, right? We have to deal in reality. And that means that we have to have legal ways for people to come. If you think that you, if you're worried about the undocumented because you quote, don't know who they are, all right, let's find a way for them to be legal. Let's yeah. find a way for them to apply from where they are. And so then we know who all those people are. And you can start to tear at the pieces that are under the bad assumptions that underlie the bad policy and really push people towards something more constructive. Yeah. It makes me think of how we started your uh, description of what security means. And you were saying, you know, bringing them into a system as opposed to leaving them out is more secure. And I, that really stood out to me. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, I, I just want to say, though, I mean, when we think about the status of the undocumented, when I said earlier that poll after poll keeps showing that majorities of Republicans and Democrats actually support legalization, can I say how amazing that is? It's huge, yeah. I started working on immigration policy in 1998, and the number of people who believed that people undocumented in the United States should be given what was then called amnesty, the A word, um, was less than 30%. And now we have a majority of people in both parties saying, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, wow. <laughs> okay, so, so when you think you're up against a wall, please, please, please understand how far we've come in this conversation. Yeah. We have come a long, long way. I think that's a great point to transition <laughs> to the audience. Thank you for that. Um, so at this point, I'd love to give an opportunity for anyone who wants to ask a question. Oh, lots of questions. Great. Okay, I saw some hands over here first. So let's go with this person. I think there's yellow. Yes, you. Mm -hmm. uh, howdy. My name is Alan. I go to the University of Notre Dame, but I live in Texas. Uh, oh, in and you're wearing a Stanford shirt. So my husband's a donor. I wonder so if you're, you're confused. confused. <laughs> um, my question is, what does victory look like for y'all? Um, I know on one hand, here as a group, we want to have 
uh, we have a lot of the ask, but beyond sort of that ask, what is victory? Is it a complete reform of the system? Is it open borders? What does victory look like? I'll take that one first. So I, we advocate for a top to bottom overhaul of our current immigration system. We don't think that it meets the needs of our 21st century economy. And if we want to ensure the future prosperity, vitality, and security in the United States, we need to have a system that works better. And that's a legal migration system that is more open with opportunities across skill levels. Um, you know, President Bush likes to say we're all children of God. And, and how that extends to the economics is that we all have something to give and contribute regardless of our skills and education levels, right? And we know we have job openings across the economy. And so I wanna see a system that has a legal migration system that works and that's accessible. Um, and I wanna see a border policy that facilitates that legitimate trade and travel. Uh, we wanna have a system that works across, um, across our borders, works with our allies. We wanna have a system that, where we really do lead the world on humanitarian migration because uh, that to me is who we are as a nation. Um, we are that beacon of freedom and opportunity. We're not doing a great job of that right now. Uh, a lot of other co countries copy our asylum policies and how we treat asylum seekers. We don't do the best job at that. So we need to get back to a footing where we can do a good job at that. I'm old enough to remember when it was leaders in the Republican Senate that were the most forward leaning on humanitarian yep. refugee yeah. and asylum in the United States. Former Senator Brownback is somebody that I think of yeah. on that. Um, for, I, I, something similar to me, I mean, again, going back to 1998 when I first started doing immigration policy, our dear departed friend, Dimitri pa Papa Dimitriou uh, of the Migration Policy Institute created this idea of the grand bargain, which was a three-legged three stool, which was reforming the legal immigration system for all of the reasons that Laura just said. It was providing a pathway to citizenship for most of the undocumented who are here. And then it was addressing border security in a way that would, along with reforming the immigration system, reduce the chances of a large undocumented population happening again in the future. That's the three-legged stool that I think is still out there. That's the, that's the total victory. Um, because, as I said earlier, they're not unrelated, right? If you just fix one part of the system, you're only fixing one part of the system, and you may not be changing things that much for the future. And so that's what I, that, you know, ideally, that's what we'd love to see. But honestly, I will take anything at this point that can pass on a bipartisan basis. Anything passed. <laughs> I'll take I'll take something over nothing every day. Yeah, that's really where I'm at. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You can come over here. Um, yes, right here in the gray shirt. Someone is gonna come with the microphone. Awesome. My name is Emily Jerome. I'm from um, Ohio with Bowling Green State University. Um, thank you for coming here and speaking with us. I, I have a lot of like great information that I learned, and I really appreciate all of that. Um, I kind of just wanted to ask, like, we're we're kind of in agreement, and we've talked about since day one about the seventy percent of Americans who support the legalization of undocumented immigrants. So, what what are we waiting for? You know, <laughs> like, really, like, let's yeah. let's yeah. let's let's draft up this legislation, right? Like, well, what's yeah, the, the legislation is drafted. There's a lot of different forms of it. Um, right. But it gets I back to what I said is the politics. Yeah. Um, particularly on the Republican side, politically, immigration is a more salient issue for Republicans, but on the restrictive side. Yeah. Republicans will go out to vote in primary elections uh, based on how tough their member is on border security. Unfortunately, Democrats, immigration is not as driving an issue for voting. It's where, like number one or number two for Republicans, it's three to five for Democrats, mostly. So for Democrats, even though they're very supportive of a pathway to citizenship, they're not gonna win or lose an election based on whether or not they get that done. And they're less likely to be primaried on, on that issue alone. So the political incentives for each party right now don't favor getting it done. Even if they can come to agreement on the policy, the politics are really hard. And the only way to change that is to change things on the ground. So I love that you guys are here in Washington. I love it. If you're talking to your members who represent your home state and where you live, you represent their constituency. And they need to hear more from their constituency, two things. What you would like to see them do and why you will, you will be mad at them and not vote for them if they don't get it done. 
right? Like they need to hear both of those things. It's not enough to say this is what I want. They have to know that their constituency is gonna hold them accountable if this thing doesn't happen. And I don't think enough members right now feel that. Uh, so I, I assume that most of us attending this conference are left leaning. Mm -hmm. So if we're calling up our representatives and telling them our, our list of things, yeah. but that's not going to have as much of an impact, like you said, on um, the Republican if, or more if conservative. That's not good, so then you, when you go back home, you need to talk to more people in your community who may or may not be on the same side of the issue as you and get them to talk and, and get them to come alongside so that you have more people talking to him, not just you, right? That's the grassroots effort. How That's many of you really live changed. and vote in a red district? How many of you have family members that live and vote in red districts? Okay. Yeah. Some of this is political leadership, and political leadership doesn't have to start at the top. It can start with you. It is. And getting your friends and family members to think that this is important enough that they vote on that basis in primary elections. I, I mean, it's harder having a conversation with your own family member who disagrees with you than it is a stranger on Capitol Hill. I know that. I know that, too. I have these conversations a lot. Yeah. It is. It's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you're more emotionally invested in that relationship. But try. Do your best. Yep. And a lot of it starts with the same things that we're talking about here. I talk to my dad, who is a very strong Trump voter, every day. And I'm like, Dad, why do you say that? He's like, oh, and he spouts off something he heard on TV. I'm like, well, let me tell you what's really happening underneath there. I have these same conversations. <laughs> and little by little, I whittle away until he has to think about it more than just the soundbite. Yeah. Well, one of you said, I mean, it is a success to have someone, maybe they don't physically take any action, but for them to be thinking about something a different yeah. way is yes. a success. That's, that's where you have to start. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's... Yeah. It, it's you know, it's very, I mean, if, you ha if it happens, fantastic. But it's rare, very rare that one conversation will completely change somebody's mind. Right. Bear that in mind. You have to have thousands of conversations. And you have to have hundreds of people having all of those conversations. That's what changes things eventually. But that little bit of doubt, that little bit of, oh, I never thought of that way. Oh, I didn't hear that. I didn't know that. Hmm, that's interesting. Let me ponder on that. That's the start. That's the door opening. Yep. Yeah. I actually forgot to mention earlier, we are having people join us from online because this is a hybrid event. So uh, we'll go to them in a moment and see if there's any questions from them as well. Um, but OK, I see someone pointing very adamantly over there. <laughs> so let's take uh, one more question here in the ballroom, and we'll check with the virtual audience. Hello. Uh, thank you. So being from Miami, Florida, which is a city full of immigrants, mm -hmm. even there, there's a diversity of opinions on immigration and pathway to citizenship, even among immigrants themselves, maybe they don't support pathway to citizenship for the ones that haven't yet like came to America. Yeah. But that's besides like that was just the context of the question. Mm -hmm. um, so in the past couple of weeks, like over 300 Haitian migrants have landed in like Key West um, on like makeshift boats, mm -hmm. um, and usually they just get sent back to Haiti um, immediately. Um, what in your ideal like ideally, what is how should they be treated and how should like, the, the government respond to this? <laughs> I'll go first. So the reason they're being expelled immediately is because of something you've probably all heard of at this point called Title 42, uh, which is a public health guidance saying that we're not going to process people under immigration law. We're just going to turn around and, and, and expel them. Um, we're denying them the ability to request asylum. And I, I believe that people who want to request asylum here should have that opportunity. Here's where the real problem comes in. Our asylum system is so backlogged that instead of getting a decision quickly that allows them to know where they, where they stand, right? And whether they're gonna be able to put down roots here, whether they have to go back home and figure something out. Um, our asylum system drags the process out for several years at this point. They really do need a faster adjudication. I think we can probably do that with some changes to the way that we do it and who's in charge of running those interviews and those adjudications. But we need to do it in a way that also protects their legal rights and make sure that that legal right to, uh, to asylum is protected. And I think we can make that happen, but there needs to be the willingness to make those changes. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, if the, the, the answer is not to prevent people from their right to ask. The answer is to provide all the resources necessary so they can ask and get an answer fairly quickly. Right. Yeah. And we don't do that. Uh, and, and we're not the only country. I mean, Europe has been doing it for several years now. And, and we have decided that, um, that we'd rather keep people out than let them ask for asylum here. 
Um, and I think that that is unsustainable in the long term. That's the problem, is that we keep having to get harsher and harsher on this, and it, that, that's not going to last very long. Great. Thank you for that question. Thank you. So I'll see now if there's anything um, in the virtual audience, if there's any questions. Sarah, hi. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> there she is. We get to see her. That's lovely. Sarah, are there any questions? Hi, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, we have, let's see, we have one question. I'm going to go to Shloka Gidwani, who's going to ask a question live on camera. Um, go ahead, Shloka. Hi, uh, my name is Shloka, and I study at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts. And you mentioned that the pathways to citizenship is a temporary solution for a more deep-rooted problem with the immigration system, uh, especially with people overstaying their visas instead of using legal avenues. So my question is, uh, are there any concrete uh, solutions to the deep-rooted issue instead of, just, uh, instead of just the temporary one of pathways to citizenship? Thank you. Um, one issue we haven't really touched on, um, and I think Bear's mentioning, is that our legal immigration system right now is so broken that for many people trying to come legally from many parts of the world, they, even if they get in line today, they will not actually get a green card until they're 90. So when you understand that, and you have people who are now waiting in that green card backlog for decades, so long that their children who they brought, came here uh, when they were young are now turning adult and losing the eligibility to immigrate with their parents. And they become undocumented too. Um, this, is, this is a larger problem and it, and it means that we have to have a rethink. Some of it is just more visas, but another, another part of it is we have a system designed in 1965 that sounds really fair on its face. Every country in the world gets 7% of the total number of green cards available. That sounds great. It's equal across the world. We're not discriminating against anybody, except what that actually means is that there are the same number of visas for India as for Bhutan. Now, as you can imagine, the demand for visas from India, because India has, what, five times, 10 times the population of Bhutan, um, is, is much higher. And so, where you were born in the world actually determines whether or not you have a legitimate chance of coming into the United States. That's not right. That's not how it should be. Um, so that's one of the fundamental things about our immigration system that probably we need to deal with and deal with soon. Yeah. When I think about this, I think a lot about, I think there's only about 10,000 employment-based green cards a year allocated to people with less than a bachelor's degree. We all know people who, lots of job openings for people with less, less than a bachelor's degree, lots of people who want to fill those jobs. Many of them are undocumented. What would it look like to just change that system so that they could actually apply for a green card, right? They're well, going to come work that job anyway. Yeah, and, and to make it even worse, it's not like we have a temporary visa they could come on either. Right. We don't we even don't. have a temporary visa for that job. So, so there is no legal visa. <laughs> There's no line possible. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Shloka, for asking that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we have time for, I'm going to say one more question should be safe. <laughs> and, um, okay, let's go over there in the blue collared shirt. Yes. Okay, wow, okay. So, um, hi, my name is John Huang. I am, um, I'm a proud and uh, raised born New Mexican, also another border state. And um, I just wanted to ask, I just wanted, so this is not, this is on, on the lines of um, immigration, but I also wanted to ask more about the dynamics of Congress a little bit more because um, um, uh, someone previously from the Ohio delegation asked, why aren't the bills, why aren't they getting anything passing? Um, and I'm pretty sure that you both are as well familiar with the dynamics now of Congress where not just on the political side, but its legislative capacity has been severely diminished um, because they're not going in the, and this is just me speaking on a lot of like terms, um, they're not going with regular order anymore. Um, a lot of party leaders have started to take that control and decide um, where one person really um, starts on, on the legislation solely. And so I was wondering, even with those chances, um, do you think Congress can get back into that, I guess, regular order to um, 
essentially expand their capacity for more um, legislation, such as immigration, that, uh, as we've been speaking for the whole hour, um, that are desperately needed. And then as well as, um, I don't know if you guys are offering any jobs soon, but I would really like to work for one of y'all's companies. That's it. Thank you. Um, and and before, before we get to the answer, I think, just because there, there is a, a variety of, of knowledge levels in the room, I think, yeah. defining what regular order means yes, and, yeah. and, and what exactly John was saying, I think would be helpful. Yeah. But thank you for that question, John. I'm going to take a little bit of privilege and ask you to go to my organization's website, bipartisanpolicy.org. We have an entire project that's called the Healthy Congress Project where we had a commission uh, chaired by former senators and members of Congress from both sides of the aisle make recommendations of how to get Congress back to working better. Um, and because it's, it's, a, it's an endemic problem in Congress right now and it's been going on for quite a while and it's not just related to immigration, it's everything. And, and some of the issues you said are, are correct. So the way Congress, how, I'm gonna show my age. How many people know Schoolhouse Rock? I'm just a bill. <laughs> Okay, you do. I don't think age matters for Guess that one. What? Everyone knows Guess that. Guess what? That, that's not how it happens. Uh, Saturday Night Live did a really great parody of it that shows that it actually happens, which means somebody introduces a bill and nothing happens with it. Right. Eventually, maybe that member, if they whisper in the ear of the right leader, will get it attached to something else that has to pass, yes. but it'll never have a hearing, it will never go through committee, and it will just end up on a piece of legislation that nobody has read because it's 16,000 pages long. That's how Congress works now. How it's supposed to work is that ideas are supposed to work their way up from the bottom. They work their way up through committee where they have a chance to debate and have hearings. Hearings and committees now are less about learning about the issues for the members and all about the members being able to yell at people with their talking points. Um, that's not how it used to be, but that's how it is now. There are people in Congress who really want to change that. Um, there's a committee in the House called the Midi Committee on the Modernization of Congress. It's a bipartisan committee that has done a great job of making recommendations to help the House work better that a lot of leadership on both sides of the aisle is looking to try to implement. So there are, there are a lot of people trying to get Congress back in the place of actually debating legislation, having those debates, having that, that compromise and back and forth and give and take so that something comes out rather than nothing. Um, unfortunately, we're not there yet. And that's another way that we, as voters, can hold our members of Congress accountable, is to ask them, what are you doing to help Congress do better? The last thing I ever want to hear from my member of Congress when I ask him about an issue is, well, I wanted to do this, but the other side wouldn't let me. You hear that all the time. Well, I would do it, but you know, those Republicans. Or I would do it, but those Democrats just block us all the time. What did you do to try to solve that? Does anybody ask that question? Do they have anything to say? Well, my leadership, uh, no, 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 what did you do? Did you go talk to a member on the other side of the aisle? Did you reach out to anybody? Did you make a friendship that could go beyond the issue of the day? Another program that we have is something called the American Congressional Exchange. Members of Congress, one Republican, one Democrat, spend a weekend in each other's district, learning what the issues are for that member, and then going see the other side. We've done 50 of these visits so far. They're becoming so popular, we don't have enough time to get them done. Members really want to do this. They want to, but they're having a hard time. They don't time. need a program to do that. <laughs> they don't. They could do, they it, on could do own, it on their own. They could do it on their own. But they need a program because <laughs> they otherwise can't figure it out. So yeah. I would say that there's, there's, there's a lot of desire and a lot of momentum, um, but it's got to come from, again, the members themselves pushing on their leadership to get it to happen. Yeah, I also think, and you know, those are all huge problems, yeah. but a lot of this is us as yeah. voters not understanding and being able to hold people to account because we don't understand that those are excuses. Like, yeah. oh, my leadership wouldn't, that's an excuse, right? That's an excuse. Um, and so if we have a better understanding of how these processes work, and, and also some of this really is, I mean, the politics of it sometimes really just don't work. Like, yeah. if, you, if you get elected to Congress because you really deeply care about reforming the tax code, you're not gonna take a hard vote on immigration, right? Unless someone spends a lot of time winning you over. And there's, so there's really rational reasons people sometimes don't do things. But we have to know the system well enough to be able to like ask the right questions and say, well, I don't, that's not true. And yeah. I know that's not true. Yeah. You didn't do anything. And I didn't see any bills filed. I didn't see any bipartisan support for your bill. Because we know you can go get co-sponsors. Yeah, did you get co-sponsors? Did you co-sponsor a bill on the other side that you agreed with? Yeah. Um, 
you know, these are the things, again, we, our Healthy College of Response has an index of, of these kinds of things. But the other thing that we talk about a lot, and our president, Jason Grumet, says this a lot, Congress is largely made up of people who have a desire to do the right thing, and they have terrible incentives. Yep. So it's, again, it's up to us to try to figure out how we can change some of those incentives to allow them to do better. Yep. Thank you. Well, I think we are at time. Um, I know there might be other questions, so I'm sorry for that. But I would love to give you both a, a final word. If, if you want to leave us with some advice, <laughs> you saw all the hands when you yeah, asked about yeah, the red yeah, district. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of big conversations ahead of our constituents that are at this event. So okay. any final thoughts would be helpful. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, you know, at the Bush Institute, we love a good call to action. Uh, what are you going to go do to help this? And you guys are already doing that first step because you're here. Um, but back to that political leadership point, that matters so much. We know political leadership on immigration in particular is a huge driver of how people feel about immigrants themselves. So um, it's incumbent upon all of you as leaders to continue to be those leaders in your communities, whether that is at home, whether it's at your university, whether it's with your own family, to try to make sure we're having really good, rational conversations rooted in reality and solutions for immigration. So I'm going to sound like an old lady here. <laughs> um, <laughs> A lot of you are very young. A lot of you are very idealistic. I think that's fantastic. You have a lot of energy. And you have a lot of desire, and you want to see things done right away. Um, I think that's great, but I also think it means that sometimes you get really frustrated when it doesn't work out that way. Um, push through that frustration. Find out how things will work. As you heard us, you know, we've been doing this a long time, and it's still hard sometimes to have those conversations. It's still hard to push through. Um, but keep at it. Don't let frustration get you down. Um, just you know, be, be understanding of the situation you're in. Know the context, but keep at it. Keep at it. Like I said, 30 years in, I, don't, I, I haven't been able to get it done. I hope you do. And I hope it doesn't take 30 years. But it may take more than a year. It took 40 <laughs> years to go from quotas to the INA. So there you go. immigration, we're you're playing of, the long game. We're in the long game. Yep. Yeah. All right, well, thank you both. <laughs> and thank all of you.